At Merrick Health, you can comprise your own lab panel if you don't want to do this full vigor Steve male lab panel over and over again. Hemoglobin A1c, which is glycated hemoglobin located within the red blood cells. When glucose enters the red blood cells, it reacts with hemoglobin, turning it into glycolated hemoglobin or hemoglobin A1c. Now this marker gives you an accurate representation of your serum glucose concentrations and average over a period of three months or so, because the active life of red blood cells is about 90 to 100 days, give or take three months. So when they check for this marker, they take the hemoglobin out of the red blood cells and determine how much of this hemoglobin is glycated hemoglobin and give that as a percentage in the form of hemoglobin A1c. Ideally, you want this to be around 5% if you're following a ketogenic diet where your serum glucose levels are chronically lower than following a diet with carbohydrates, obviously. Then you might see a hemoglobin A1c of 4.7%. But if you see a 5.5% hemoglobin A1c or a 6% hemoglobin A1c, then it's pretty much time to end your dirty bulk. You're losing insulin sensitivity fast. And instead of all of the car those carbohydrates ending up in skeletal muscle, they're now floating around in the bloodstream. And again, in many cases, when serum glucose concentrations are chronically elevated, so is fasting insulin or insulin throughout the day chronically elevated. So if you're losing insulin sensitivity, you see that your glucose levels, your hemoglobin A1c levels, and your fasting insulin levels are all elevated. This is your cue to follow a mini diet. And when I say mini diet, ideally you make that last for a couple months to get your fasting insulin, hemoglobin A1c, and your fasting glucose levels and glucose concentrations throughout the day back into healthy ranges. Now, if your fasting glucose levels are high and your hemoglobin A1c levels are high, but your fasting insulin levels are low, that might be an early indication for type 1 diabetes where your pancreas is not producing adequate amounts of insulin anymore. And again, when they're all high and you see that your hemoglobin A1c is very, very high and you suffer from all kinds of metabolic issues, that might be an indication for type 2 diabetes where you're overproducing insulin because you lost insulin sensitivity to such an extent that your muscles and all of the other organs in your body are no longer responsive to insulin, right? And this can also result into type 1 diabetes where you're literally burdening the beta cells of the pancreas to produce so much insulin that they no longer want to produce insulin and now you have type 1 diabetes, right? Keep track of these three markers, are very important. If you're taking anything that can alter your blood glucose levels or change insulin sensitivity levels, again, like MK677, for example, which is known to reduce insulin sensitivity and chronic use will certainly raise your hemoglobin A1C, your fasting insulin, and fasting glucose levels when you do blood work. Insulin-like growth factor one, important to check as another marker for liver health. If you have any early signs of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, in which case your ferritin levels and your liver enzymes will be chronically elevated, even if you don't follow a carnivore diet containing a lot of iron, there's inflammation in the liver raising ferritin levels and this also means that your IGF-1 levels are going to be chronically low because your liver is too sick to produce adequate amounts of IGF-1. It's very important to check when you're young and if your fasting growth hormone levels are nice and high and your fasting IGF-1 levels are nice and high, top of the reference range, your cortisol levels are low, your prolactin is in range, your testosterone levels and your estradiol levels are nicely balanced and you're still drug-free, all of your other blood work markers come back within normal parameters. In this case, I would say you have awesome genetics. A lifetime in the fitness industry is probably for you. You can really bank before you result to performance enhancing drugs. And again, if your growth hormone levels are a little bit wishy-washy, middle of the reference range, IGF-1 levels are middle of the reference range, that's perfectly normal. Maybe exogenous growth hormone will be a solution for you or growth hormone replacement therapy, which is a thing in certain parts of the world where you get maybe one or two units exogenous growth hormone resulting in higher growth hormone levels, resulting in higher IGF-1 levels, which will be beneficial if you really care about your fitness or bodybuilding aspirations, but might not be so beneficial if you care about longevity and anti-aging, in which case there's always metformin to bring your IGF-1 levels down. Don't get your liver sick 
just to get your IGF-1 levels under control. Instead, use a medication or exclude the exogenous growth hormone, which over time will slowly lower your serum IGF-1 concentrations anyway, because they decline with age. Cystatin C with EGFR, so that's a calculated glomerular filtration rate based on your cystatin C levels, just like I mentioned before. As part of this panel, a complete blood count with a white blood cell differential platelets. The whole lot, everything is included in the complete blood count, so you know your hemoglobin concentrations, your hematocrit percentage, your red blood cells, the different white blood cells, and of course the mean corpus hemoglobin concentration, the mean corpus hemoglobin, mean corpus volume, red cell distribution with all of that as part of the CBC. Please guys, stay on top of your complete blood count. I can't emphasize this enough because blood clots seem to be a real issue nowadays. They're almost complementary with things that the government is trying to force down your throat. So keep on top of your CBC especially if you're on performance enhancing drugs, but also if you're drug free, check it every three months. Your hematocrit can change every three months or so. And maybe every month if you're really slamming the anadrol or the boldenone. Also, if you're taking selective estrogen receptor modulators, which are known to increase clotting risk, check your CBC, please. Gamma GT levels, another marker for liver health. Just check it every month. I rarely see it elevated, but it's still important to keep track of because if you do see it elevated, because Gamma GT is the most important marker for liver health, I would say if you do see that elevated, you really need to mega dose your coffee, your carnitine, your injectable glutathione or oral reduced glutathione if you believe that it has some bioavailability orally. Those will bring your Gamma GT levels in range fast. As a quick reminder, Gamma GT is predominantly found in the cell membrane of liver cells hepatocytes. So when these liver cells or hepatocytes are destroyed in the metabolism of medications, drugs, or steroids, the Gamma GT spills into the bloodstream, allowing you to detect them with blood work. And when there's a lot of destruction of hepatocytes, not only will your liver enzymes be elevated, but your Gamma GT levels as well. So if you see your liver enzymes elevated without high levels of gamma GT, that might indicate that some of these liver enzymes, the ALT and the AST, are coming from skeletal muscle, which are then uh, slightly damaged, allowing these amino transferases to end up in the bloodstream. But when gamma GT levels are elevated, that means hepatocyte destruction. Keep track of that. Check them every month. But if you're drug-free or you're just on cycle on a TRT, Maybe you check your gamma GT levels every six months or so because you're not doing anything that would result in abnormal amounts of hepatocyte destruction. Serum iron and your total iron binding capacity, very important to keep track of when you're following a diet with a lot of iron, like a carnivore diet, for example, containing a lot of beef, which is rich in iron, or you're taking a lot of vitamin C alongside of your dietary food sources, which promotes iron absorption, or again, you're taking a lot of anadrol and equipoise, which is also known to increase hematocrit levels and resulting in more iron recycling. Alongside of your ferritin levels, which is another marker for liver inflammation, of course, the iron is stored in ferritin. So you have to take the iron and the ferritin with the total iron binding capacity to assess if your dietary intake of iron is sufficient or too much or insufficient or your serum iron levels and ferritin levels are so high, but there's no indication of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease forcing you to do a therapeutic phlebotomy, assuming that your hematocrit levels are too high. Again, many of these markers are all related. You can't make a decision on one marker alone. You need to take several markers and a couple issues that you might be facing before you take drastic measures like a therapeutic blood donation or a phlebotomy or um, scan for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease through a fibro scan, which we'll address in a separate video. Lipid panel with LDL to HDL ratio. This also contains total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL and LDL, obviously. If you're drug-free, you can check this every six months or so, just to make sure that your HDL, LDL, and your triglycerides and your total cholesterol all within range. And of course, if your dietary practices are way off, then you might need to make some adjustments because you'll see that your lipid panel is way off. If you're enhanced, check it every month. No excuses. You check 
your total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, and LDL every month. I don't care if you're on TRT or on a full-blown cycle, in which case your HDL is going to be very, very low single digits, and LDL probably very, very high unless you put something into practice to keep your LDL and total cholesterol levels under control in the form of an azetamide or a PKS9 inhibitor or some sort of statin or citrus bergamot or daily fasted cardio or fish oil or garlic extract. Man, there's a million different ways to keep your cholesterol and your LDL and HDL in range or when you're using performance enhancing drugs somewhat in range. Ideally, you check it every month just to make sure everything is going according to plan. You don't have to check your APO, A1 and B and ratio or lipoprotein little a every month. Maybe you check that every six months, you put the things in place to keep those particular lipid markers in range the best you can, drug-free or enhanced, and then recheck maybe a month later and then do a follow-up every six months or so just to make sure that everything is going according to plan. And again, the APOA1 and B and lipoprotein little a are all individual markers for cardiovascular health. When you're elevated, you increase the risk for cardiovascular disease, especially if your high sensitivity C-reactive protein levels are elevated too. And when I say elevated, anything over one milligram per liter, I consider elevated, not the range of five milligrams per liter, which is the clinical reference range for high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Guys, I've made so many videos about high sensitivity C-reactive protein on this channel. Do yourself a favor, give this channel a search. I'm not going to repeat it. I will say stay away from the synthetic solvents that underground labs use. And please stay away from Arachis oil and ethyl oleate, which are still being used by pharmaceuticals, even though they are known to increase systemic inflammation and raise your HSCRP levels well over one milligram per liter. In many cases, five milligrams, 10 milligrams, 50 milligrams per liter I've seen from pharmaceutical ethyl oleate in Arachis oil formulations. Stay clear, guys. Stay clear, check your HSCRP levels if you're using performance enhancing drugs or recreational drugs because even smoking weeds or vaping can increase your inflammatory markers. And if your lipid panel is off, your APOA1 and B and lipoprotein little a are off, your triglycerides are off, your total cholesterol is off, this systemic inflammation will do you in and cause plaque buildup in your coronary artery or other arteries. And well, with all the complementary clotting issues going around nowadays, you really want to stay on top of your lipids, your inflammatory markers, and your complete blood count. Also check your homocysteine levels, which is another marker for systemic inflammation. It's a little bit of a funny marker because some people never see their homocysteine levels elevated, just like mine are never elevated, and I've checked them a multitude of times. And other people see their homocysteine levels elevated for the smallest of reasons. It could be an underlying illness or a micronutrient deficiency or an adverse reaction to certain foods or medications, right? If you suffer from any of these issues or have something underlying, it's very important to keep track of your homocysteine levels. But if you see your homocysteine levels never elevated, you probably don't have to check them so often because more often than not, you will see your CRP levels elevated before your homocysteine levels are elevated due to the chronic drug exposure that people in the fitness industry generally subject themselves to. So this marker is a little bit person dependent, but it's still important to check every six months or so, even if you're not suffering from any underlying illness. Total creatine kinase, also known as creatine phosphokinase, CPK. There's actually three isoenzymes of creatine kinase. CKBB, predominantly found in the brain. So if your CKBB concentrations are elevated, this indicates brain injury. CKMB, which is important to test alongside your troponin T and pro BNP, which are uh, markers for heart health. CKMB is predominantly found in the heart. And then there's also CKMM, which is predominantly found in skeletal muscle. Now, when you see your total creatine kinase elevated, most likely it's because it's predominantly consisting of CKMM found in skeletal muscle, your training intense. But if you're unsure or you have a little bit of an issue with your heart, some numbness, arrhythmias, any other issues with your heart, please specify a CPK test 
with CKMB, troponin T and pro BNP to see if there's an issue with your heart or your CPK levels are simply elevated due to the strenuous workouts that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Most people will have elevated CK levels. Keep that in mind. If you want to bring them down, it might take a week or two, depending on how high they are. I've seen CPK levels as high as 5,000 units per liter on men who are perfectly healthy, just training with demons in the back of their head. I've seen it myself. My CPK has been as high as 5,500 units per liter. It's not an indication of poor kidney function or brain trauma or heart trauma or heart attack. It just means you're training very, very hard, but it's still important to keep track of. I check my creatine kinase CPK levels every month, just like my BUN and my creatine levels, just to make sure everything is going according to plan. And if I feel a little bit off, I will check my CKMB, which is heart specific, to make sure that there's no injury or strain on my heart. Bilirubin total and direct, we already discussed these two markers in the comprehensive metabolic panel. It's basically the difference between conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin. Uric acid, another marker for kidney health. Important to check, I would say monthly, or maybe every six months if you're drug-free, monthly for the people who are enhanced, or every three months at least. If you don't have any kidney issues or your creatinine levels and your cystine C levels are always nicely in range and your CPK levels are always nicely in range, which basically means you don't have so much muscle and you don't really train so hard. Still, it's important to keep track of your uric acid levels. I can't say that I've ever had a consultation with anybody worldwide suffering from gout, which is the buildup of uric acid in your connective tissues of your hands resulting in rheumatoid arthritis. Again, it's a hydration issue and the metabolism issue of purines resulting in high uric acid levels, which are not flushing out with water. So the best solution you can do to reduce and keep your uric acid levels in range is simply by staying hydrated. Trimethylamine and oxide, TMAO. Now this marker I can't test here in Thailand, but luckily at Merrick Health, you can test for it. If your diet consists of a lot of creatine or carnitine or choline, whether that's from dietary sources or over-the-counter supplements, there is a risk that your gut microbiome produces TMA, converting into TMAO in the liver. TMAO is linked to all kinds of metabolic issues, including cardiovascular disease. So it's important to check this at least once in your life to see if your gut microbiome is converting creatine, choline, carnitine into TMA, which then your liver converts into TMAO, right? Test it at least once. If you're in the green and your TMAO levels are undetectable, then you're probably in the green for a couple months, if not a year or two, because your gut microbiome doesn't change that fast unless you're really trying with a peptide like LL37 or antibiotics, or you're going on a raw food diet, or you're doing a stool transplant. All of that aside, if your TMAO levels are undetectable, you're probably good to go for a couple months, if not years. But if they are elevated, then you definitely need to incorporate an LL37 peptide or antibiotics or more drastic measures to get these negative bacteria in your gut, which are producing TMA, resulting in TMAO, resulting potentially in cardiovascular disease or other issues further down the line. So you really have to change your gut microbiome. If this marker is elevated. So it's important to check at least once and then maybe multiple times afterwards to see if your protocol is actually working and your body, these, these gut microbiome bacteria are producing less and less and less TMA. And now you've resolved this potential negative health ramification, which can manifest years later. This panel also contains a basic urinalysis, checking your creatinine, checking for white blood cells in your urine, making sure that your urine doesn't contain any protein or blood or ketones, right? Checking the specific gravity of your urine, just making sure that your urine is perfectly healthy and your kidneys are functioning accordingly. As part of this comprehensive Vigor Steve lab panel, there's also a venipuncture draw fee that's taking the blood from your arteries to send that in for checking. I believe that this panel contains all of the most important markers you should check at least once per year. If you're drug-free, 
maybe every six months if you're enhanced. And then some of the markers on this panel, depending on your personal goals, what you're taking, what you're doing with your life in your free time, you might check them every month, every three months or so. And again, at Merrick Health, you can comprise your own lab panel if you don't want to do this full Vigor Steve male lab panel over and over again. Use Vigorous for 10% discount at checkout on your first lab panel. For everybody else, please let me know down below in the description section what your favorite clinic is to do blood work with very fast turnover of the results because you're probably just like me. I want my results today, latest tomorrow. I don't want to wait a week certainly not two weeks that's way too long my blood work parameters have already changed if i need to wait two weeks so please list your favorite and fastest clinic down below i'll make an article on my website talking about articles i have two separate articles about blood work parameters which are important whether you're drug free or enhanced blood work markers you should test before you decide to take performance enhancing drugs which is even more extensive than this Vigor Steve a male lab panel at Merrick Health. I'll link up in the description section. For now, I think we pretty much covered everything. There's way more workers we can discuss. Maybe that's a, a subject for another video in the future. For now, we're out of time. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the description section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigorous crew, I know you already liked, so leave me another comment to fuel the algorithm. A front double bicep for you guys. I will do blood work here in Thailand at Bria Labs this Sunday. Hopefully Monday or Tuesday, I'll have the results for you guys. And then I will show you the next steps on my performance enhancing drug journey. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.